preface to pioneer life among the loyalists in upper canada this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by david wales pioneer life among the loyalists in upper canada by w s harrington preface to present a picture of the early settlements of ontario and enter into the daily life of the pioneers is a most fascinating task as we visit these historic districts and mingle with the descendants of the men and women who built the first log cabins in the forest we imbibe the spirit of their simple life many of the old landmarks recall the stories of strange experiences we have so often heard and the presence of the very flesh and blood of the first actors in the drama of the long struggle in the wilderness makes the scene all the more realistic we think we can discern in the honest faces and general demeanour of these living links in our history something which indicates a deep-rooted sense of citizenship and a consciousness of a responsibility in keeping inviolate the traditions of their ancestors in the following pages i have endeavoured to bring the reader into closer touch with the first settlers many excellent historical works have traced the development of our province and laid before us the achievements of our public men in vain may we turn over volume after volume in our search for information concerning the evolution of the homestead and the customs and peculiarities of the common folk of long ago for the most part the sources of my information have been original documents and interviews with old men and women many of whom have since passed away even from such sources it is an easy matter to fall into error but i have discarded what i feared was not trustworthy and believe that i can confidently ask the reader to accept the general statements of facts as thoroughly reliable I wish to acknowledge the receipt of many valuable suggestions from the Honourable Mr. Justice Riddle of Osgood Hall, Toronto, and Dr. James H. Coyne of St. Thomas. I am also deeply indebted to Dr. M. R. Morden of Adrian, Michigan, the late Peter Bristol of Napany, and Elisha Rutan of Adolphus Town, for much useful information regarding the pioneers. W. S. H napany ontario december first nineteen fifteen end of preface one of pioneer life among the loyalists in upper canada by w s harrington this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter one the first settlers of upper canada one of the unexpected outcomes of the revolutionary war was the effective settlement of what afterwards became known as upper canada up to that time the greater part of this rich territory was a wilderness to which the white man had attached little value except in respect to the part it played through its chain of forts in giving access to the great fur-producing tracts of the interior of the continent although the french governors had frequently advocated the introduction of settlers into this part of canada with a view to establishing the supremacy of france more securely upon the great lakes very little had been accomplished in that direction the net result was a few military posts along the border and a french settlement in the neighbourhood of detroit the entire european population grouped about a few centres did not exceed two thousand throughout the rest of this territory where now we find busy towns thriving villages and well-equipped farms one might have travelled for weeks without meeting a human being save perhaps a solitary trapper with a small bundle of peltries upon his back that the rich farmlands of what is now the banner province of canada were apparently so long overlooked might appear strange if we do not bear in mind that there was no shortage of territory well adapted to agricultural purposes on the atlantic seaboard and on the lower st lawrence it must also be remembered that the fur trade had for nearly two centuries held first place in the regard of the government bodies of canada and that little care was bestowed upon the agricultural possibilities of the lands bordering upon the upper st lawrence and the great lakes the manner in which the settlements were begun was more remarkable than the long delay in beginning them 
in most instances new territories have been opened up for settlement by a few hardy pioneers whose numbers were added to year after year but here we have a whole colony coming in as one body taking up all the desirable lands in the front concessions of a score of townships the loyalists were above the ordinary type of immigrants who too frequently having made a failure of life in their native surroundings seek other fields in which to begin anew their struggle for existence when the thirteen british colonies declared their independence there were many thousands of their best citizens men of means and influence who looked upon the british flag as their best safeguard of freedom and justice and they declined to take up arms against their motherland their loyalty brought down upon their heads the wrath of the leaders of the revolutionary movement their property was confiscated some were thrown into prison and in a few instances the death penalty was inflicted for no other offence than their allegiance to the british crown in the face of such threatened dangers thousands rallied to the standard of the king and many more who for various reasons did not enlist in the army made no secret of their loyalty to their sovereign when hostilities were concluded the persecutions still continued and the loyalists found themselves little better than outcasts from their own homes giving up all hope of regaining their property or receiving compensation for their losses they set about to seek new homes under the flag for which they had sacrificed so much thousands went to england many more thousands immigrated to the british west indies nova scotia and what is now new brunswick and large numbers were attracted to the rich farmlands in that territory which was afterwards known as upper canada in the autumn of seventeen eighty three a great body of emigrants sailed from new york and coming around through the gulf of st lawrence wintered at sorrel in the present province of quebec in the following june they proceeded by means of flat-bottomed boats to the land provided for them by far the greater number settled in the new townships laid out under instructions from governor haldimand on the st lawrence and as far west as the head of the bay of quinta only a few went farther west and settled in the neighborhood of niagara and detroit during the next four years straggling bands of one or more families came by different routes to share the fortunes of the first great army of settlers and the strictest care was exercised by the authorities to see that none but those who had demonstrated their loyalty to the british cause were admitted to the new settlements the appellation united empire loyalist was not conferred indiscriminately upon all applicants but was a mark of honor bestowed only upon those who had taken their stand for the unity of the empire and who had allied themselves with the royalists before the treaty of separation in seventeen eighty three the terms of the proclamation creating this new canadian aristocracy were broad enough to embrace practically all of the first settlers of seventeen eighty four and those who arrived during the succeeding four years in seventeen eighty eight representations were made to the governor lord dorchester that there were across the border many relatives of the loyalists and other persons who although they had not joined the royal standard were favorably disposed towards the british with the view of securing a further body of desirable settlers lord dorchester gave instructions that all applicants who upon examination proved to be unexceptionable in their loyalty and good character should be given certificates of location for lots of not more than two hundred acres to each but upon the express condition that they should become bona fide settlers never were the portals of a new settlement more scrupulously guarded none but the strong and determined would in any event venture north to hew out a home in the forest and the government took good care that only those who were likely to become good citizens were admitted when by the constitutional act of seventeen ninety one the separate provinces of upper and lower canada were created the lieutenant governor of upper canada john graves simcoe threw the gate wide open and issued a proclamation inviting emigrants to enter the new province without any adequate provision for inquiring into their loyalty or character among those responding to the governor's invitation were some who had actually borne arms against the king 
many of the loyalists resented this lack of discrimination and complained that the favors which should have been reserved for those only who had remained faithful in their allegiance to the king were being showered upon his enemies these criticisms upon the character of the newcomers were no doubt well merited in some cases but whatever views they may have entertained during the stormy days of the revolution they could have had only one object in coming to canada and that was to better their condition they did not need to be told that their interests were identical with those of the earlier settlers who had entered the country at a time when it was more difficult to gain admission they were not entitled to receive the mark of honor but before many years had passed all differences had been forgotten and they and the loyalists worked together for the common good the main body of loyalists the settlers of seventeen eighty four to the number of about ten thousand came in organized bands some being remnants of the battalions that had been engaged in the war and in some cases they were under the command of the same officers whom they had followed while upon active service they however were not military organizations in the sense in which we view the term to-day they were not fighting machines but were bent upon a peaceful mission in anticipation of their coming the government surveyors had been busy for months in laying out the townships the newcomers were experienced farmers and understood well the advantages of a home upon the shores of a body of fresh water in a country where as yet there were no roads the water afforded an easy means of communication by boats in the summer and by sleds upon the ice in winter they also looked forward to the future when their flocks and herds pasturing upon the cleared lands could find abundance of water to drink without leaving their enclosures many of them had previously lived near to the bays lakes and rivers of their native states and had learned to love the companionship of the water the longer one has lived upon the banks of a stream or the shores of a bay the more loath is one to live amid surroundings of a different character there is a charm about the presence of the water which baffles any effort to describe it there is a sublime majesty about a mountain a weird loneliness about a desert an appealing mystery about a prairie but a body of water particularly a small navigable one seems to comport with all one's moods it would have been difficult to convince some of our pious and sainted grandmothers that our lakes bays and rivers did not leave their moral effect upon those who lived along their shores who is so dead to the influence of his surroundings that he has not stood spellbound upon the shore as the boisterous waves broke with an angry roar at his feet no sooner has one wave spent its energy than another with a fury as relentless rushes madly forward followed by countless others and yet there is no apparent loss of power or who could sit unmoved upon a moonlit night and look upon the silver sheen upon the placid bosom of the water and not feel the inspiring presence of that grand object lesson of peace perfect peace why should it not be a part of the divine plan of the creator to mould our character by these evidences of his power and omnipresence End of chapter one pioneer life among the loyalists in upper canada by w s harrington chapter two building and furnishing the log cabin when the first loyalists landed in the different points along the shores the lots had not yet in most cases been marked out by the surveyors and they were obliged to wait several weeks before the drawings could take place they had brought with them a number of military tents which had seen service during the revolutionary war camping out in tents as a recreation for a few weeks during the summer is still looked upon as a rather pleasing pastime it was however very annoying to the loyalists they had left their homes across the border several months before to enable them to be ready to take possession of their new homes in the early spring and every day lost meant one day less for them to prepare for the coming winter they had no alternative but to pitch their tents near where they had landed and wait until the surveyors had completed their work several weeks were thus passed in idleness and the first summer was far spent before the drawings took place 
this was a simple process small pieces of paper upon which were written the numbers of the lots to be apportioned were placed in a hat and the surveyor with a map spread out before him superintended the operation the officers came first and drew their lots in the first concession fronting upon the water as each drew forth a piece of paper from the hat the surveyor entered his name upon the corresponding number upon the map after the officers had been served the other members of the company went through the same ceremony during the few weeks that they had been waiting some had made short trips through the forest and had observed favourable locations and after the drawings were completed there was more or less trafficking in lots and exchanging locations for a consideration but for the most part each accepted the lot drawn and hurried away to his future home the white village upon the shore was soon a scene of great confusion each family secured a few days rations from the government supplies packed up the tent and their other belongings and set out through the lonely forest unless one has visited a section of canada from which none of the timber has yet been removed it is difficult to form a proper conception of the condition of the older settled portions one hundred and thirty years ago the debris of the forest lay rotting as it had fallen the swamps were undrained the rivers and creeks were unbridged and the only roads were the blazed trails left by the surveying parties the clearing up and draining of the farms has brought about a great change in the lowlands large impassable creeks have been reduced to small streams that can be crossed with ease and the swamps which threatened to mire any one who ventured over them a century ago furnish now a safe and firm foothold it was with difficulty that the lots could be located as there was nothing to indicate the boundary lines but the markers placed by the surveyors when the little family group arrived at their destination they pitched their tent again and the housewife busied herself in preparing their first meal in their new home while the husband surveyed his domain noting the character of the soil the presence of creeks mounds and other conditions favourable for the first clearing and the erection of a house that the selection was in most cases wisely made is attested to-day by the excellent natural surroundings of the old homesteads as they partook of their first meal in their wilderness home they contrasted their primitive surroundings with the comforts and luxuries they had left behind them but with no regret for the sacrifices they had made they laid their plans for the future on the morrow the father and the sons if there were any and not infrequently the mother too set out to do battle with the forest the short-handled ship-axe not much heavier than the modern hatchet was their principal weapon they laboured with a will and cleared a space large enough for the cabin there was no cellar nor foundation as for our buildings of to-day a small excavation to be reached through a trap-door in the floor by means of a short ladder served purpose of the former and a boulder placed under the ends of the base logs at each corner of the building was ample support for the walls it was slow work felling the huge pines cutting them into proper lengths hewing them into shape and laying them into position but slowly the building rose until it attained the height of nine feet then the rafters were set in position then too the chimney was commenced a stone foundation was carefully built up to the level of the floor and crowned with flat stones to serve as the hearth the huge fireplace was then built of stones and above it was erected a chimney in a manner similar to the house but instead of using logs small sticks two or three inches in diameter were laid tier upon tier in the form of a hollow rectangle it was carried a foot or two above the peak and plastered over with clay inside and out in many of the early dwellings there were no chimneys and the smoke was allowed to escape through a hole in the roof as best it could in some of the first cabins the floor was of earth if made of wood large timbers were used squared on the sides and hewed smooth on the upper surface paint was very scarce and a painted floor was a luxury which very few could afford a clean floor was the pride of the mistress of the house coarse clean sand and hot water were the materials used to obtain it once a week or oftener the former would be applied with a heavy splint broom and the latter with a mop the hotter the water the quicker it would dry 
while the perspiring mother was scrubbing amid clouds of steam the tub of boiling water was a constant source of danger to her young children the roof was composed of thick slabs hollowed out in the form of shallow troughs and these were laid alternately with the hollow sides up the convex form of one overlapping the edge of the concave forms of those on either side there was an opening for a door but no lumber was to be had at any price unless it was sawed out by the tedious process of the whip saw so doors there were none but a quilt hung over the opening served the purpose two small windows one on either side of the door admitted light to the dwelling these windows would hold four or six seven inch by nine inch panes of glass but many a settler had to content himself with oiled paper instead the sash he whittled out with his pocket knife sometimes there was no attempt at transparency and the window was opened and closed by sliding a small piece of board set in grooves backwards and forwards across the aperture the interstices between the logs were filled with sticks and moss plastered over with clay thus the pioneer's house was complete and not a nail or screw was used in its construction when lumber became available a plank or thick board door took the place of the quilt in the doorway this was fastened by a strong wooden latch on the inside the latch was lifted from without by means of a leather string attached to it and passed through a hole a few inches above and when the inmates of the house retired for the night or did not wish to be molested the string was pulled inside the old saying the latch string is out was a figurative method of expressing a welcome or saying the door is not barred against you the pioneers had big hearts and to their credit it can be said the latch string was rarely pulled in when a stranger sought a meal or a night's lodging if the family were large the attic was converted into a second room by carrying the walls up a log or two higher poles flattened on both sides were laid from side to side to serve as a ceiling to the room below and as a floor for the one above a hole left in one corner gave admittance by means of a ladder and one small window in the gable completed the upper room for the same reason there was no door there was precious little furniture some of the loyalists brought with them from their former homes a few pieces a grandfather's chair a chest of drawers or a favorite bedstead but as a rule there was no furniture but such as was hewed out with the axe and whittled into shape and ornamented with a pocket-knife a pocket-knife and a pen-knife were not the same the former was a strong knife made to serve many useful purposes while the latter was a small knife carried mainly for the purpose of shaping quill-pins for a bedstead there was a platform of poles across one end of the room about two feet above the floor supported by inserting the ends between the logs in the wall bow benches with four legs served as seats and a table was similarly constructed on a larger scale later on when lumber was obtainable these articles of furniture were replaced by more serviceable ones the deal table the board bench and the old-fashioned chair with the elm bark bottom and back woven as in a basket were one step in advance it not infrequently happened that in large families there were not enough seats to accommodate all and the younger members stood up at the table during meal-time or contented themselves with a seat upon the floor if a bedstead could be afforded it was sure to be a four-poster with tester and side curtains what was a tester do i hear someone inquire it was a cloth canopy supported by the four tall bedposts bunks were built against the walls which served as seats in the daytime but when opened out served as beds at night mattresses were made of boughs corn husks straw or feathers and rested upon wooden slats or more frequently cords laced from side to side and end to end of the framework of the bedstead a trundle bed for the children was stowed away under the bedstead during the daytime and hauled out at night this was like a large bureau drawer with rollers or small wooden wheels on the bottom and handles in front the handles consisted of short pieces of rope the ends of which ran through two holes and were knotted on the inner side 
as soon as the iron could be procured a crane was swung over the fireplace and from it were suspended the iron tea-kettle and the griddle the latter was a large disc upon which pancakes were made it was supported by an iron bale and was large enough to hold eight or ten fair-sized cakes the frying-pans were similar to those in use to-day but were furnished with handles three feet long so that they could be used over the hot coals of the fireplace the bake-kettle was an indispensable article in every household it was about eighteen inches in diameter stood upon short legs and would hold four or five two-pound loaves or their equivalent the coals were raked out on the hearth the kettle set over them and more coals heaped upon the iron lid these were replenished above and below from time to time until the bread was thoroughly baked the bake kettle was superseded by the reflector which was an oblong box of bright tin enclosed on all sides but one it was placed on the hearth with open side next a bed of glowing coals in it were placed the tins of dough raised a few inches from the bottom so that the heat could circulate freely about the loaves the upper part of the reflector was removable to enable the housewife to inspect the contents the reflector in time gave way to the bake oven which was built in the wall next the fireplace so that one chimney would serve for both or the oven was built outdoors under the same roof as the smoke-house the latter was a comparatively air-tight brick or stone chamber used for smoking beef and the hams and shoulders of the pigs before the advent of the smoke-house strips of beef required for summer use were dried by suspending them from pegs in the chimney the reflector was sometimes used for roasting meat but where the family could afford it a roaster was kept for that purpose the roaster was smaller than the reflector but constructed in a similar manner and running from end to end through the centre was a small iron bar one end of which terminated in a small handle or crank this bar called a spit was run through the piece of meat and by turning the handle from time to time the meat was revolved and every portion of the surface was in turn brought next the fire the drippings from the meat were caught in a dripping pan placed underneath for the purpose these drippings were used for basting the roasting meat and this was done with a long-handled basting spoon through an opening in the back which could be easily closed at will as there were no matches in the early days the fire was kept constantly burning and when not required the coals were covered over with ashes where they would remain alive for hours occasionally the coals would die out and then one of the younger members was sent away to a neighbor to obtain a pan of live ones most families were skilled in making a fire by striking sparks from a flint upon a dry combustible substance or by rapidly revolving one dry piece of pine against another as the indians used to do but these practices were slow and were not resorted to except in extreme cases the blazing logs in the fireplace furnished ample light during the winter evenings the inventive genius of man has since produced the kerosene lamp gas acetylene electricity and other illuminants but none of these can furnish the bright welcome of the pine knots blazing about the old-fashioned backlog if any other artificial light was required the tallow dip was the only alternative this dip was a tallow candle in use before moulds were introduced a kettle was placed over the coals with five or six inches of water in the bottom when the water was brought to the boiling point there was added the melted tallow this remained on the surface of the water the only service the water was intended to render was to support the tallow by raising it so many inches above the bottom of the kettle where it could be used much more easily than it could if it remained at the bottom the candle wicks were twisted with a loop at one end which was slipped over a small stick five or six wicks would be thus suspended from the stick and slowly dipped into the liquid tallow by which process the wicks became saturated as soon as the tallow congealed they were dipped in again and the operation repeated until the wick was surrounded by a thick coating of tallow very similar to the ordinary wax or tallow candle of to-day but not so smooth or uniform in size as those made at a later period in the moulds 
dishes were scarce as cooking utensils a few earthenware plates bowls and a platter were displayed upon a shelf and they were all the house could boast of others were whittled out of the fine-grained wood of the poplar and served the purpose fairly well until the yankee peddler arrived with the more desirable pewter ware a corner cupboard from whose mysterious depths even in our time our grandmothers used to produce such stores of cookies doughnuts tarts and pies completed the equipment of the first house of the pioneer End of chapter two pioneer life among the loyalists in upper canada by w s harrington chapter three the struggle with the forest unless the site for the homestead was conveniently near a spring or other never-failing supply of fresh water one of the settlers first requirements was a well the location for this was as a rule determined by a divining rod of witch hazel in the hands of an expert confidence in this method of ascertaining the presence of water has not yet died out the writer witnessed the payment of five dollars last summer for a service of this kind when the well was dug and stoned up heavy poles were laid over it to protect it a pole terminating in a crotch several feet above the ground was planted ten or twelve feet from the well the height depending upon the depth of the well in this crotch rested another pole called a sweep from the small end of which suspended over the centre of the well hung the bucket the sweep was so balanced that its heavy end would lift the bucket of water from the well with very little effort upon the part of the operator during the first season barns and stables were not required as the settler had neither stock nor crop of grain when he did need barns and stables they were built of logs in the same manner as the house a small clearing about the house was made the first year and in this was planted some turnip seed this patch was carefully guarded and yielded a small crop of roots which were stored away for winter use in a root cellar built for the purpose the root cellar was a small rough enclosure of logs built in a bank or the side of a hill and covered over with earth little further progress could be made in the new home until more land was cleared stock introduced and farming operations begun in earnest the clearing was accomplished only after many years as the land was densely wooded and even with the aid of the cross-cut saw and the oxen it was slow work getting ready for the plough the farmers worked early and late battling with the forest single-handed and in bees cutting and burning the valuable timber which to-day would yield a fortune then the only return from this timber was the potash made from the ashes the stumps were most unyielding particularly those of the pine and all kinds of contrivances were devised to uproot them sometimes they were burned out but this was a slow process and a large portion of the soil about them would be injured by the fire blasting powder was used and many patterns of stump machines were employed but the most common and perhaps the most satisfactory method was to sever the roots that could be easily reached hitch a logging chain to one side bring it up over the top and let the oxen tip over the stump by sheer brute force the pine stumps made excellent fuel for the fireplaces and were also used for fences the word potash is indicative of the process of its manufacture and the chief article from which it was made it was in great demand as a bleaching agent and was extensively used in the making of soap shiploads of it were annually exported from canada nearly every farmer had a leech a large v-shaped vat which he filled with ashes over these he poured a quantity of water which filtered through the ashes dissolved took up in solution the alkaline salts and trickled out of the bottom in the form of lye a certain amount of this liquid was required for the manufacture of soft soap for the farmer's own use this was made by adding some animal fat to the lye and boiling it down for several hours the ordinary fireplace provided all the ashes needed for this purpose the large quantity made from burning the timber and clearing up the land was carried one stage farther for convenience in handling 
the lye was boiled down in a huge kettle capable of holding fifty gallons or more and when it reached the proper consistency it was transferred to a large iron pot known as a cooler where it congealed into a solid and in that form received the name of potash when the country storekeeper became firmly established he received it in exchange for his merchandise and not infrequently purchased the ashes and manufactured it himself upon a large scale some of the farmers hauled their ashes in with their oxen but the merchant also kept one or more teams thus employed when not engaged in drawing his goods to and from the nearest shipping point up and down the concessions the creaking ash wagons went gathering in all that was left of the once proud forest that had been cleared away to make room for the plough convenient to the store was an ash yard with half a dozen leeches in operation and the fires were kept roaring under the kettles here the wagons unloaded the ashes upon a platform suspended from one end of an evenly balanced beam while iron weights of fifty-six pounds each or some other fractional part of the long ton were placed upon a smaller platform suspended from the other end of the beam this was the customary method of weighing bulky substances that could not be conveniently weighed by the steel yards when the first crop of grain was obtained it was harvested with the crude implements of the day and conveyed to the threshing floor as a rule this consisted of a bare piece of ground sometimes covered with boards or flat stones but more frequently the bare earth had no covering here the grain was pounded out with a flail and nature supplied the fanning mill the mixed grain and chaff were tossed into the air during a stiff breeze and the chaff was blown away to convert the wheat into flour was a more difficult matter the government had provided a few little hand mills but they were not adapted to the purpose so that the settler took a lesson from the indian burned a large hole in the top of an oak stump and pounded the wheat to a powder with a pestle or a cannon-ball suspended from the end of a sweep it was not many years before government mills were erected at different points where there was a sufficient supply of water power the localities thus served suffered little inconvenience as compared with less favored districts ten fifteen or twenty years wrought a great change in the wilderness home small clearings were everywhere to be seen barns had been built the houses had been enlarged and the melodious tinkling of bells betrayed the presence of cattle sheep and swine were also found on every farm but they had to be guarded to protect them from marauding bears and wolves of horses there were but few awkward as the ox may appear he was more than a match for the horse in finding a sure footing among the stumps logs and fallen timbers breaking in buck and bright to come under the yoke and to respond to the gee haw and the snap of the whip was a tedious undertaking but was successfully accomplished the general store made its appearance but the pioneer had learned to be independent and still supplied most of his own wants he raised his own flax and when it was ripe he pulled it by hand tied it into small sheaves so that it could dry quickly and shocked it up when it was cured it was taken to the barn and threshed out with a flail the straw was then spread out on the ground and left for two or three weeks until it had rotted sufficiently to permit the stalks to be broken without severing the outer rind which supplied the shreds the object was to get it in such a condition that this outer part could be freed from the inner it was first put through a crackle which was a bench four feet long composed of three or four boards standing on their edges and just far enough apart that the three or four similar boards framed together and operated from a hinge like a pair of nut crackers would when closed down drop into the several spaces between the lower boards the straw was passed over the lower boards at right angles and the operator raised and lowered the upper frame bringing it down on the flax breaking the stalks and loosening the outer shreds from the inner pulp to remove the pulp the stalks were then drawn over a heckle which was a board with scores of long nails protruding through this combed the coarser pulp away when the same process was repeated over a finer heckle which left the shreds ready to be spun into thread on a spinning wheel similar to but smaller than that used in spinning wool 
the thread was then bleached dyed wound into balls and passed on to the weaver the farmer also raised his own sheep sheared them and washed and carded the wool every maiden served her apprenticeship at the spinning wheel and her education was not complete until she had learned how to spin the yarn pass it over the swift and prepare it for the loom which had become a part of the equipment of nearly every house the linen flannel and full cloth for the entire family were made upon the premises service was more sought after than style particularly in the everyday clothes and if the mother or maiden aunt could not cut and make a suit the first itinerant tailor who happened along was installed as a member of the household for a fortnight and fitted out the whole family for the next year the boots and shoes were also homemade or at least made at home somewhere about every farm was to be found a tanning trough in which a cowhide would be immersed for three weeks in a weak solution of lye to remove the hair and any particles of flesh still adhering to the skin it was then transferred to a tub containing a solution of oak bark and left for several months after which it was softened by kneading and rubbing and was then ready to be made up the making of the boots required considerable skill a man can wear and obtain good service from an ill-made suit of clothes but a poor-fitting pair of boots is an abomination likely to get the wearer into all sorts of trouble corns and bunions are not of modern origin but have afflicted the human race ever since boots were first worn a kit of shoemaker's tools composed of a last hammer awls and needles was to be found in every house and some member of the family was usually expert in adding a half-sole or applying a patch few however attempted to make the boots the travelling shoemaker went about from house to house and performed this service a few years later every neighbourhood had its tannery and every village its one or more shoemakers the tanner took his toll for each hide and the shoemaker for a bag of potatoes a roll of butter or a side of pork would turn out a pair of boots which would long outwear the factory-made article of to-day the skins of the bear fox and raccoon furnished fur caps for the winter and the rye straw supplied the material for straw hats for summer in nearly every house some one would be found capable of producing the finished articles from these raw materials the milliner as such would have had a hard time in earning a living a hundred years ago as headgear at that time was worn to protect the head the life of the early settlers was not all work and drudgery they had their hours of recreation and what is best of all they had the happy faculty in many matters of making play out of work this was accomplished by means of bees there were logging bees raising bees stumping bees and husking bees for the men while the women had their quilting bees and paring bees the whole neighbourhood would be invited to these gatherings it may be that upon the whole they did not accomplish more than could have been done single-handed except at the raisings which required many hands to lift the large timbers into place but work was not the only object in view man is a gregarious animal and loves to mingle with his fellow-men the occasions for public meetings of any kind during the first few years were very rare there were no fairs concerts lectures or other public entertainments not even a church school or political meeting so in their wisdom the early settlers devised these gatherings for work and work they did but oh the joy of it all the latest news gathered from every quarter was discussed notes were compared on the progress made in the clearings the wags and clowns furbished up their latest jokes and all enjoyed themselves in disposing of the good things brought forth from the corner cupboard perhaps some special mention should be made of the logging bee since it stands out as the only one of these jolly gatherings that was regarded as a necessary evil particularly by the female members of the family perhaps the grimy appearance of the visitors had something to do with the esteem in which they were held at such times the logging bee followed the burning of the fallow which consumed the underbrush the tops and branches of the trees and left the charred trunks to be disposed of 
in handling these the workers soon became black as negroes and the nature of the work seemed to demand an extraordinary consumption of whisky anyway the liquor was consumed the men frequently became disorderly and concluded the bee with one or more drunken fights it was this feature of the logging bees that made them unpopular with the women the afternoon tea now serves its purpose very well but modern society has yet to discover the equal of the quilting bee as a clearing-house for gossip to the credit of the fair sex we should add that they rarely made use of intoxicants but the old grannies did enjoy a few puffs from a blackened clay pipe after their meals both men and women were more or less addicted to the use of snuff whisky was plentiful in the good old days but the drinking of it was not looked upon with such horror nor attended with such disastrous consequences as in our day this difference was probably due both to the drink and the drinker some people will not admit that any whisky is bad while others deny that any can be good but the whisky of a hundred years ago does not appear to have had as fierce a serpent in it as the highly advertised brands of the present day it possessed one virtue and that was its cheapness when a quart could be purchased for sixpence a man could hardly be charged with rash extravagance in buying enough whisky to produce the desired effect it was considered quite the proper thing to drink upon almost any occasion and upon the slightest provocation and if a member of a company received an overdose and glided under the table it created no more sensation than if he had fallen asleep as the population increased taverns were set up at nearly every crossing of the roads some of these especially the recognized stopping places of the stage coaches were quite imposing hostelries and as the guests gathered about the huge fireplace on a winter's evening and smoked their pipes drank their toddy and exchanged their tales of adventure and travel the scene was one that has no counterpart in our day it was a form of sociability and entertainment that departed with the passing of the stagecoach in this age of railroads and motor-cars we have no conception of the discomforts of travel eighty or a hundred or more years ago the loyalists clung for many years to the bateau the flat-bottomed boats which conveyed them over the last stage of their journey to their new homes these boats were very popular upon the bay of kent in going west they were carried across the carrying place at the head of the bay by a man named asa weller who kept a low wagon and a yoke of oxen ready at hand to transport the travellers from the bay to the lake and back again upon the return trip it is needless to add that weller's bay was named after this enterprising teamster in eighteen sixteen the first stage line in upper canada was inaugurated between kingston and bath by samuel purdy of bath and in the following year he opened a line from kingston to york the roads were wretched and the fare was eighteen dollars fourteen years later william weller a son of asa whose business of transporting the bateau from one body of water to the other had brought him in contact with the travelling public and acquainted him with their needs established a bi-weekly service between the carrying place and york in connection with the steamer sir james kemp which carried the passengers on to prescott the fare from york to prescott was two pounds ten shillings ten dollars the stage left york at four o'clock in the morning arriving at the carrying place the same evening the very term stage-coach suggests to our minds a spanking foreign hand in brass-mounted harness attached to a gaily decorated conveyance we picture them dashing through a village under the crack of the coachman's whip away they go rattling over the bridge down the turnpike and with a shrill blast of the guard's horn they haul up at the wayside inn where a fat and smiling landlord escorts the passengers in to a hot dinner such were not the stage-coaches of our forefathers they were simply lumber wagons without springs and covered with canvas like the prairie schooners or plain wooden enclosures with seats suspended by leather straps just think of being cooped up in such an affair from sunrise to sunset the clumsy coach jolting over the rough roads dodging stumps rocks and fallen trees 
plunging down a steep embankment fording rivers and streams and sinking now and then to the axles in mud during the summer months the mosquitoes and black flies added to the misery of the travellers even so in this as in all things the pioneers looked not so much on the dark side of life as on the bright the distance had to be covered every jolt and bump brought them one step nearer their destination the tales of the fellow travellers were entertaining and helped to shorten the way perhaps one was a legislator just returning from a meeting of the house perhaps a merchant on his way to montreal to make his year's purchase of goods or a young adventurer from the old country spying out an opportunity to better himself in the new world the forest had its charms although the insects at times were abominable as the coach passed through a clearing the yeoman with a swing of his hat would wish the travellers godspeed the monotony was broken time and again by a glimpse of a bay or lake and the road in places followed the beach where the waves broke under the horses feet awaiting them at the journey's end were that rest and peace which the home alone can afford that bright welcome of the fireside built with their own hands and the smiles of the loved ones who had shared all their trials and victories end of chapter three of pioneer life among the loyalists in upper canada by w s harrington chapter four early courts and elections all that territory from the ottawa river to the detroit in which the loyalists settled inclusive of the western bank of the latter river was of course part of the province of quebec but there was very little in common between the newly arrived settlers and their french neighbors on the lower st lawrence there were no judges no lawyers and no regularly established courts in any of the new settlements the people were too busy to devote much time to litigation the nearest court was at montreal and to the english-speaking settlers the french civil code which was in force was an untried experiment and they wisely endeavored to avoid making use of the legal machinery at their disposal minor differences were frequently referred to some of the officers who had been appointed to take charge of the bands of immigrants when they left their former homes these officers did not profess to be versed in the law but they had exercised a certain amount of authority during the voyage and in locating the families committed to their care and in distributing the supplies it was quite natural that they should be appealed to when the parties to a dispute were unable to come to a satisfactory understanding between themselves they were not hampered by hair-splitting precedents or long-established forms of procedure but they made the best of their common sense in their efforts to apply the golden rule and so far as is known substantial justice was done as early as seventeen eighty five indeed the justices of the peace were given jurisdiction in civil cases up to five pounds twenty dollars but they had little to do and their courts were very informal on the twenty fourth of july seventeen eighty eight lord dorchester governor of quebec issued a proclamation dividing the newly settled territory into four districts as follows lunenburg composed of all that portion east of the gannicock river mecklenburg from gannicock to the trent nassau from the trent to a line running north and south through the extreme projection of long point into lake erie and hesse that portion of the province west of the last mentioned line there was established in each district a court of common pleas of unlimited civil jurisdiction presided over by three judges except in hesse where one judge only was finally appointed attended by a sheriff and the other necessary officers in naming the first judges to serve in the newly established courts lord dorchester selected men of well-known probity from different walks of life regardless of their experience in courts of law on the division of the old province of quebec into upper and lower canada john graves simcoe was appointed the first governor of upper canada and the first parliament met at niagara on the seventeenth day of september a d seventeen ninety two 
with a due regard for the wishes of the people the first act placed upon the statute book abolished the french code and declared that in all matters of controversy relative to property and civil rights resort shall be made to the laws of england this was a longed-for boon welcomed by all classes at the same session there was passed an act for establishing courts of request for the recovery of debts up to forty shillings whereby it was declared to be lawful for any two or more justices of the peace acting within the respective limits of their commissions to hold a court of justice on the first and third saturdays of every month at some place fixed within their respective divisions for the purpose of adjudicating upon these small claims it was essentially a justice's court they appointed their own officers devised their own forms and laid down their own method of procedure these courts afforded the magistrates an opportunity of appearing upon the bench and taking part in judicial proceedings without calling for the exercise of any superior legal knowledge this was a privilege which many of them greatly enjoyed and of which they took full advantage as is shown by the fact that as many as ten have been known to preside at a sittings although only two were necessary footnote i find upon an examination of the records of the court of requests held at bath covering a period of eight years from eighteen nineteen that rarely were there less than four justices present frequently there were more than that number and at the four sessions of march and april eighteen twenty seven there were seven ten six and eight respectively End note there were no courthouses at the disposal of the justices when the act first came into force and only one in each district when buildings were afterwards erected so they were forced to hold their courts in private residences taverns or any other convenient room that could be secured when we endeavor to picture a row of justices behind a deal table across the end of a low-ceilinged kitchen crowded with litigants any preconceived notions of the dignity of the court of requests are speedily dispelled in eighteen sixteen the jurisdiction of the court of requests was extended to claims of five pounds where the amount of the indebtedness was acknowledged by the signature of the defendant or established by a witness other than the plaintiff it did not take merchants long to discover that it was greatly to their advantage in more ways than one to take from their customers promissory notes in settlement of their accounts for by thus obtaining a written acknowledgment of the debt an action for the recovery of the amount within the increased jurisdiction could be brought at a trifling expense in this court by another act of seventeen ninety two the german names of the four districts were changed respectively to the more acceptable english ones eastern midland home and western and provision was made for the erection of a jail and courthouse in each of them before these very necessary public buildings were erected even the higher courts were held in cramped and uncomfortable quarters it is said that the first sentence of capital punishment imposed in upper canada was pronounced in a tavern on the shore of the bay of kent at bath and as summary execution was the recognized method of carrying into effect the judgment of the court the convict was immediately hanged to a basswood tree on the roadside only a few rods distant the pathetic part of this tragic incident is that it was afterwards learned that the poor victim was innocent of the charge of which he was found guilty the theft of a watch such a stigma attached to this particular basswood tree that it was adopted and used for years as a public whipping post footnote this incident was i believe first published by dr caniff in eighteen sixty nine in his settlement of upper canada i am unable to point to any official record bearing out his statement but up to a few years ago old residents including descendants of the tavern keeper told the story and evidently believed it End note. in the early courts the parties before them were occasionally represented by counsel but the only recognized standard of admission to the bar was under an ordinance of the old province of quebec and few were called under such conditions it can readily be conceived that it would be difficult to maintain any uniformity in the practice 
in seventeen ninety four the legislature empowered the governor lieutenant governor or person administering the affairs of the province to authorize by license under his hand and seal such and so many of his majesty's liege subjects not exceeding sixteen in number as he shall deem from their probity education and condition of life best qualified to act as advocates and attorneys in the conduct of all legal proceedings in the province in eighteen o three the demand for lawyers had become so pressing at least so it was alleged that an act was passed making it lawful to add in a similar manner six more practitioners to the roll neither of these acts called for any educational test or professional experience it is not therefore a matter of surprise to learn that the gentlemen of the long robe who were thus admitted to the bar were sometimes alluded to as heaven-born lawyers though some of them were of the highest standing one becoming a judge of the king's bench another treasurer of the law society the law society of upper canada which has now its headquarters at osgood hall toronto may properly be classed among the pioneer institutions of the province it came into being under the provisions of a statute of seventeen ninety seven which made it lawful for all persons then practising at the bar to form themselves into a society under the name which it still retains the declared purpose of the society in addition to caring for the needs of the legal profession was to support and maintain the constitution of the said province it was created a body corporate by an act of eighteen twenty two and its affairs are administered to-day upon somewhat the same lines as those upon which it was first formed before the arrival of governor simcoe many of the communities had organized their town meetings and appointed their local officers such as clerks constables and overseers of highways the provisions of the first statute authorizing such meetings were based upon the organizations already in existence so that the idea of local self-government did not originate with the legislature parliament merely legalized and made general throughout the entire province the holding of just such town meetings as had already been organized in many of the older townships footnote for instance the town meetings of the township of sydney date from seventeen ninety one and those of adolphus town from seventeen ninety two although the statute authorizing them was not passed until july seventeen ninety three End note it is no particular mark of superiority to-day to be enrolled as a justice of the peace not so in the early days of upper canada the humblest citizen may now in correspondence be addressed as esquire but a hundred years ago all hats were doffed when the squire passed through the streets of a village he was a man of some importance he tried petty offences in his own neighbourhood as a member of the court of requests minor civil actions were heard by him but as a member of the court of general sessions he rose to his greatest dignity this body of justices assembled in general sessions not only disposed of criminal cases except those of the gravest kind but were clothed with executive power as well they enacted local legislation for the districts which they represented they levied and dispersed the taxes granted licenses superintended the erection of courthouses and jails the building of bridges and generally performed the functions of our municipal councils of to-day they met periodically in the leading village of the district and sometimes remained in session for a week and considering the amount of business they transacted they were very expeditious as compared with the modern county council few would gainsay the statement if i were to add that the municipal legislators of to-day frequently do not in many other respects attain the standard of a hundred years ago the town meetings continued to meet once a year on the first monday in march to appoint officers and although they had no jurisdiction to do so to pass repeal and amend enactments for purely local purposes these prudential laws as they called them regulated such matters as the height of fences the running at large of certain animals and the extermination of noxious weeds the people favoured the town meeting as it was of their own making it was the first step in democratic government by and for the people 
the chronic grumbler found there an opportunity to air his grievances the loquacious inflicted his oratory upon his assembled neighbours each man to his liking played his part at the annual gathering and realized that he was of some consequence in controlling the affairs of the township thus did the inhabitants continue to encroach upon the authority of the justices in session who from time to time issued their decrees dealing with some of the matters over which the town meetings had assumed jurisdiction until eighteen fifty when our present municipal system was introduced and the justices were practically shorn of all but their judicial power parliamentary elections to-day are very tame affairs compared with those of a century ago the open vote afforded opportunities for exciting scenes that the rising generations know not of the closing of the bars on election day has robbed the occasion of a good deal of romance the actual voting contest is now limited to eight hours from nine to five and to-day one may rest peacefully in a room adjoining a polling booth and not be aware that an election is in progress it was all very different in the days of our grandfathers whisky and the open vote were two very potent factors in keeping up the excitement instead of having several booths scattered throughout each township there was only one in the electoral district the principal village in the district was generally selected but sometimes the only booth was set up in a country tavern especially if it was in a central location and the proprietor could pull enough political strings a platform was constructed out of rough boards and protected from the weather by a sloping roof on monday morning of election week the candidates and their henchmen assembled in the vicinity of the platform which was known as the hustings the electors came pouring in from all parts of the district each party had its headquarters at a tavern or tent or both where the workers would lay their plans the forenoon was spent in listening to the orators of the day and at one o'clock the polling began it is easy to imagine what would happen to the doubtful voter when he arrived at the village as the poll was kept open all day and every day until saturday night it is not quite so easy to picture the scenes during the last day or two of a hot contest couriers with foaming horses were going and coming heated discussions frequently terminated in a rough-and-tumble fight in which a score or more participated drunken men reeled about the streets until carefully stowed away by their friends in a tent or in a stall in the tavern stable if the inebriate had not polled his vote his whilom friends were most solicitous in the attention bestowed upon him it not infrequently happened that the indifferent voter purposely played into the hands of both parties it was a golden opportunity for free lunches and free whisky and the longer he deferred the fateful hour when he had to announce to the returning officer the candidate of his choice the more difficult it was for him to choose in his dilemma he would seek his solace in a little more whisky and in the end perhaps vote for the wrong man if unhappily he did make such a mistake his political guardians never failed to call his attention to the error in a manner not likely soon to be forgotten such incidents were thereafter associated in the mind of the offender with unpleasant recollections of the village pump or the nearest creek End of chapter four five of pioneer life among the loyalists in upper canada by w s harrington chapter five school teachers and preachers the loyalists were so busy in clearing the land and getting the new home into shape that little time was left for looking after such matters as educating the young there were no laws regulating the school system no buildings nor funds for school purposes no officials to take the lead and what was done was the spontaneous outcome of a desire to equip the rising generation for the duties of citizenship footnote the first enactment of any kind respecting schools in upper canada was passed in eighteen o seven this made very inadequate provision for the establishment of one public school in each district the first legislative attempt to encourage assist or regulate common schools was by an act passed in eighteen sixteen both of these statutes were very crude and left much to be desired 
End note. The first efforts were those of the mother and other elder members of the household. Later on, a few families clubbed together and employed a man to instruct their children in the rudimentary elements of a common school education. There was no building for the purpose, so a room was set apart in one of the dwellings, probably the only room on the ground floor, and while the good housewife busied herself about her duties on one side of the room, the teacher was training the young ideas how to shoot on the other side. For one or two weeks he would remain with this family, getting his board and washing and two or three dollars a week, and then he would move on to the next neighbor with his little flock, and so on until the circuit of his subscribers of five or six families was completed, when he commenced again at the first. As late as 1818, in a contract entered into between a teacher and a few of the farmers in one of the first townships, we find the covenant to teach in the following words that the party of the first part engages to keep a good school according to his ability and to teach reading writing and arithmetic his hours were from eight o'clock in the morning until four in the afternoon with one and a half hours for noon he was to teach every alternate saturday in addition to his board lodging and washing he was to be paid the princely salary of twelve and one half dollars a month whereof one half in cash at the end of the quarter, and the other in orders or other value monthly. Soon the little log schoolhouse appeared, not larger than fifteen by twenty feet, with a door in one end and a window on each side. On the inside, holes were bored in the logs about two feet six inches from the floor, pegs inserted, and upon these pegs rested a plank, this was the desk, and the pupils, while working at it, necessarily sat with their faces towards the wall. A rude bench without a back was the only seat. Books were very scarce. About the only real school book that ever found its way into the hands of the pupil was Mayer's spelling book. The New Testament was the universal reader, and if any other books were in use in the school, the teacher was the only one who had access to them. The three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic, were the extent of the general curriculum. There were no authorized textbooks, and such as were in use were far from perfect. Footnote. The Act of 1816 required the trustees of each school to report to the District Board of Education the books used in the school, and it was lawful for the Board to order and direct such books not to be used but no one was clothed with authority to order what books should be used. End note. For many years the only geography used in the schools contained the following information relating to the continent of America. What is America? The fourth part of the world, called also the New World. How is North America divided? Into Old Mexico, New Mexico, Canada, or New France, New England, and Florida. The next answer must have been particularly enlightening to the ambitious youth thirsting for knowledge. What is New France? A large tract of ground about the river St. Lawrence, divided into east and west, called also Mississippi or Louisiana. Having given this very lucid explanation, the author then proceeds to make his readers feel at home by acquainting them with their neighbors. What does the east contain? Besides Canada, properly so called, it contains diverse nations, the chief of which are the Esquimo, Hurons, Christinals, Algonquins, Ectomans, and Iroquois. The considerable towns are Quebec, Tadoussac, and Montreal. What is New Britain? It lies north of New France and is not cultivated, but the English who possess it derive a great trade in beaver and originic skins. In passing, it may be pointed out that Originac, or more correctly Orignac, was the name applied to the moose. The painful part of the story of this most extraordinary geography is that what I have already quoted was all there was between its two covers in any way touching upon North America. Footnote. Documentary History of Education in Upper Canada, Volume 1, page 106. End note. The great drawback to the legislative efforts to improve the system was the lack of uniformity. Each section, and later each district, followed its own inclination, 
and no satisfactory results were attained until edgerton ryerson introduced his reforms and brought every school in upper canada under the same general supervision the old teacher of the pioneer days is gone from us forever and while he served his day and generation as well as he could we cannot entertain any feelings of regret that he will never return brute force played an important part in his system of instruction the equipment of no school was complete without a taws or leather strap and the offending pupil was frequently dispatched to the neighbouring woods to cut from a beech tree the instrument of torture to be applied to his particular case the minor parts of speech were recognised as such not from the functions performed by them in the sentence in which they appeared but from the fact that they were in the list which the pupil was forced to memorise with was a preposition because it was in the list of prepositions and forth was an adverb because the teacher said it was and if by chance from nervousness or any other cause the boy with a treacherous memory failed to place it under its proper heading a flogging was considered a proper chastisement for the offence it sometimes happened that a boy did not see eye to eye with his teacher upon this question of corporal punishment and a scrimmage would ensue if the teacher came out second best his usefulness in that neighbourhood was gone to be learned as the teacher was supposed to be was a distinction which gave him a certain amount of prominence and opened up for him several other fields of usefulness he was frequently called upon as arbitrator to adjust complicated accounts or to settle disputes in the measurement of wood or lumber or to lay out a plot of ground with a given acreage he was the court of last resort in matters of orthography and spelling if he happened to be of a religious turn of mind he might be called upon to fill the pulpit in the absence of the regular clergyman the squire and the school-teacher each played his part in the administration of the affairs of the neighbourhood each carried some weight and commanded a certain amount of respect but both yielded first place to the clergyman while there were several other denominations the anglicans presbyterians and methodists formed the great mass of the population the anglicans were the pampered class they received most of the public favours and were correspondingly haughty and independent for the first fourteen years of the settlement the clergymen of this church enjoyed a monopoly in the matter of marrying it was a common occurrence before there was a protestant parson or minister duly ordained residing in the province for a justice of the peace to tie the knot and in rarer cases still for a military officer to perform the ceremony footnote all such marriages were confirmed and made valid by the marriage act passed in seventeen ninety three and it was declared lawful for a justice of the peace to solemnize marriages under certain circumstances when the parties lived eighteen miles from a parson of the church of england in seventeen ninety eight the privilege of performing the marriage ceremony was extended to the ministers of the presbyterian church and as they did not insist upon the wedding party going to the church the minister secured many fees which otherwise would have gone to his anglican brother of the cloth the great democratic body of methodists were severely handicapped and did not come to their own until eighteen thirty one when the gate was thrown wide open and the clergy of nearly every recognized religious denomination were placed upon the same footing in respect to marrying as the anglicans and presbyterians some of the extreme loyalists could not reconcile methodism and loyalty to the crown and the records inform us of more than one persecution for preaching the doctrines of the methodist church in fact one duly elected member of the legislative assembly was refused his seat in the house because he had upon occasion filled the pulpit in a methodist meeting-house it is only fair to those who supported such extreme measures to explain that these extraordinary occurrences took place at a time when the feeling in this country against the united states was very strong and the methodist body in upper canada was under the jurisdiction of a general conference across the line the life of a preacher even in our day is not one of unadulterated bliss but as far as the comforts of this world are concerned the modern clergyman has a very easy time of it when compared with the life of the pioneer preacher of a hundred or more years ago 
then the clergyman travelled on horseback with his bible and a change of clothing in his saddle-bags preaching ten or twelve times a week in churches schoolhouses taverns and the log cabins of the settlers wherever a few could be collected to receive the gospel message in all kinds of weather he might be seen plodding along through the heavy snowdrifts or fording the unbridged streams upon his holy mission to the remotest corners of the settlements no complaint escaped his lips as he threaded his way through the lonely forest now and then humming a few snatches from some old familiar hymn perchance he halted beside a spring for his midday meal and fervently thanked god from whom all blessings flow as he hauled from his spacious pockets the sandwiches furnished by his host of the night before his circuit extended sometimes for fifty sixty or an hundred miles and he rarely spent his evenings at home if he had one but slept where night overtook him glad of the opportunity to share a bunk with his parishioners children or make himself as comfortable as he could upon a mattress on the floor his uniform may have been frayed and not of the orthodox cut his sermons may not have possessed that virtue of brevity which so many congregations now demand they may have fallen far short of some of the sensational discourses of to-day but he was a faithful exponent of the gospel the plain and simple truth as he found it exemplified in the life of our saviour that the pioneers closely followed the tenets of the golden rule is largely due to the self-sacrificing efforts and exemplary life of the early missionaries among the methodists no other religious gathering could compare with the camp meeting it was the red letter week of the year given up wholly to prayer singing and exhortation in selecting a location for these annual gatherings there were several details to be considered the first essential was a grove high and dry and free from underbrush accessible both by land and water the auditorium was in the shape of a horseshoe about one half acre in extent surrounded by tents made of canvas or green boughs supported by poles across that part corresponding with the opening in the shoe was a preacher's platform in front of it was a single row of logs the penitent bench and the rest of the space was filled with parallel rows of logs the pews thither by land and water came the devout methodists of the district but then as now the women far outnumbered the men in their religious observance with them they brought chests of provisions their bedding and bibles morning noon and night the woods resounded with songs of praise the warning messages of the preachers and the prayers of the faithful pitched in every conceivable key the surroundings seemed to add an inspiration to the services when the great throng joined fervently in all hail the power of jesus name to the accompaniment of the rustling leaves the hearts of all present were deeply moved during the closing exercises marching in pairs around the great circle with mingled feelings of gladness and sorrow they sang lustily the good old hymns and then with many affectionate leave-takings dispersed to their several homes the methodists looked upon dancing not only as a very worldly but also as a very sinful form of amusement and as the violin was closely associated with the dance it also was placed under the ban the loyalists were musically inclined but during the first years of the settlements little opportunity was offered for the development of their talents in that direction later on singing in unison was extensively practised and singing schools were organized during the winter months in nearly every neighbourhood there was a great scarcity of musical instruments before the introduction of the accordion and concertina both of which were invented in eighteen twenty nine the members of the society of friends or quakers as they were more commonly called were sorely handicapped by reason of their refusal to take an oath under any circumstances by their strict adherence to this article in their creed they were debarred from holding any public office or giving evidence in any court of law that this was a great hardship from which no relief could be obtained except by legislative enactment goes without saying one of their number was regularly elected to the first parliament and trudged through the forest to the seat of government at the assembling of the members from purely conscientious scruples he refused to take the prescribed oath 
so his seat was declared vacant and he trudged back home again it is not to the credit of the other denominations of christians that no steps were taken to relieve the quakers from the disability under which they were placed until twenty-five years of patient endurance it is true the disability was self-imposed but they were actuated by the purest of motives and their exemplary lives and standing in the community entitled them to more consideration from their fellow-citizens the relief first extended to them after the lapse of a quarter of a century was only partial and allowed them to give evidence in civil courts by a simple affirmation instead of an oath the legislature having to that extent admitted the principle of affirming instead of taking an oath could find very little to justify its course in postponing for another twenty years the admission of the quakers to their full rights by accepting their affirmation in criminal courts and in all other matters in which an oath was required the quakers took a most decided stand against the law of primogeniture whereby the eldest son of a man who died intestate inherited all the real estate of his father to the exclusion of all the other sons and daughters in this respect they were in advance of their age and insisted upon an equitable distribution among all the children of the deceased many a young friend was given the alternative of dividing among his brothers and sisters the real estate thus inherited according to law or of submitting to the humiliation of being expelled from the society to their credit it can be said that very rarely was there any occasion to enforce the latter alternative the statute abolishing primogeniture came into force on january first eighteen fifty two the quakers were uncompromising in their opposition to the liquor traffic and could be relied upon to support all measures for the advancement of temperance they were progressive in educational matters they established and maintained efficient schools and generally took a deep interest in all matters directed towards the general improvement of the country beneath their quaint garb and solemn faces there frequently was found a deep sense of humour all the more effective when expressed in their peculiar form of speech. End of chapter 5《Inner Life Among the Loyalists in Upper Canada by W. S. Harrington》Chapter 6 Provisions and Public Highways The staple articles of food among the pioneers were much the same as in our day pork formed the chief item of meat the hams and shoulders were smoked and the rest of the carcass preserved in a strong brine the flour was coarser than the article we get from the modern roller mills but none the less rather the more wholesome cornmeal was used much more extensively than now it was boiled and used as porridge for breakfast a thick covering of brown sugar being sprinkled over it what was left over became quite firm as it cooled and was eaten for supper with milk or cut into thin slices and fried cornmeal griddle cakes were also in great demand johnny cake was not popular as it was regarded as a yankee dish and it took a good many years for the loyalists to reconcile themselves to anything in any way associated with their former persecutors wild strawberries raspberries plums and gooseberries were to be had for the picking and the thrifty housewife always laid in a good supply the raspberries and plums were dried in the sun and put away for future use or made into a jam like the gooseberries and strawberries the maple furnished the most of the sugar but cane sugar was afterwards imported not the white lump or granulated sugar of to-day but a moist dark brown unrefined product known as muscovado tomatoes were not considered fit for human food until after the middle of the nineteenth century if grown at all the fruit was used merely for purposes of ornamentation suspended from strings in the windows under the name of love apples many believed that they would cause cancer in those eating them a notion that is not even yet wholly dead in some places although our fresh waters abounded in fish of a superior quality the loyalists were not what we would call a fish-eating people perhaps no people ever were or are as a matter of choice 
most of us enjoy a fish dinner once in a while but few if any of us would care to accept it as a steady diet or as a substitute for meat the rigors of our climate and the outdoor life of hard work seem to call for something more sustaining the bays and rivers teemed with muscalange bass salmon pickerel and pike and in the late autumn months the whitefish and herring were very plentiful the mascos were speared at night by the aid of a jack light they were even shot from the shore as they were lazily swaggering along in the shallow water in the early spring a mess of pike could be secured at any time with very little effort every inlet and creek seemed to be alive with them the white fish always has held first place among our merchantable fish in the summer season they were caught in nets upon the shoals of the great lakes and in october and november the seines were thrown across their paths as they were running up the lesser bodies of water i have heard an octogenarian whose truthfulness even in a fish story i had no reason to doubt declare that he had frequently when a boy speared fifty or sixty whitefish in one night if we examine the map of any of the first townships we find that the road allowances are in straight lines intersected at right angles by crossroads also in straight lines about the only exceptions are the roads along the waterfront which of necessity must conform to the irregularities in the shores how few however of the roads in actual use are straight we find them twisting and turning in every direction and intersecting each other at various angles during the first few years of the settlements a path through the forest was all that was required a low piece of ground a steep precipice or even a fallen tree which would present no difficulty to the modern road builder might at the time have been deemed a sufficient cause for departing from the blazed trail once such a path was laid out and improved from time to time it became a very easy matter for it to be recognized and adopted as a regular highway in time the cause for the deviation may have passed away but the crooked road remained the writer knows of several jogs in public thoroughfares which were so constructed in order to pass around buildings carelessly erected upon the road allowance many of the most important highways in ontario appear to be the shortest practical lines between certain towns or villages and were unquestionably laid out as a matter of convenience with an utter disregard for the road allowances reserved by the government surveyors during the second session of the first parliament of upper canada the legislature passed an act to regulate the laying out amending and keeping in repair the public highways and roads of the province under its provisions the whole matter was left in the hands of the justices of the peace who were declared to be commissioners of highways to lay out and regulate the roads within their respective divisions they were also given power under the sworn certificate of a majority of twelve of the principal freeholders of the district summoned for the purpose by them to alter any road already laid out or to construct new ones we can readily imagine how many of the crooks and turns in our roads were thus introduced in the first instance to serve the temporary purpose of some friend of the commissioners or to satisfy the whim of some influential landowner by the same act was introduced a form of statute labor which has deservedly met with little favor and much condemnation but has undergone little change for the better from seventeen ninety three to the present time men possessing little or no qualifications for the position are appointed pathmasters to act as foremen over their friends and neighbors annually they turn out in full force do a good deal of visiting and some work and frequently leave the road they were supposed to repair in a worse condition than they found it to overcome the accumulation of snow in the roads a very simple remedy was provided as follows in case any highways are obstructed by snow at any time the overseers are hereby ordered to direct as many of the householders on the road as may be necessary to drive through the highway so long as the present system of statute labor remains in force and gangs of unskilled workmen persist in annoying the traveling public by rendering the highways practically impassable this section might with appropriate modification be re-enacted to-day 
End of chapter 6「Pioneer Life Among the Loyalists in Upper Canada » by W. S. Harrington Chapter 7 Doctors, Domestic Remedies, and Funerals Our forefathers were subject to the same physical ailments as ourselves, but they do not appear to have suffered to the same extent from disease as we do in our day. The surgeon was rarely called upon to exercise his calling, and then only when amputations were felt to be necessary, or some mutilated member needed mending. Fashionable operations were unknown. The vicious tendencies of the bacteria in the human body were not then discovered, or if they had, war had not yet been declared upon them. Men went about their daily occupations, too busy to bother, with the microbes that the modern scientists tell us are gnawing at our vitals. Their greatest fear was from epidemics like smallpox, which occasionally swept through a neighborhood, leaving a trail of sorrow in its wake of licensed practitioners there were but few and they were for the most part attached to the military posts occasionally if the roads were passable and they felt in the humour and saw a prospective fee of respectable proportions they might be induced to visit a patient in the neighbouring townships in this as in all other matters the settlers did their best to serve themselves in no community of this or any other age have there ever been lacking the services of skilled specialists in any line very long before some unqualified individual volunteered to supply the lack it was not long before the quack doctor with his vile decoctions appeared among the pioneers strenuous efforts were made to legislate him out of existence but he managed to evade the statutory prohibitions and has even survived to the present day during the first few decades of the loyalist settlements it was not so much a question of whether the quack could practice in the township but the question more to the point was whether the educated and skilled physician could practice the settlers had become so expert in treating most of their complaints that they rarely deemed it necessary to secure the services of the medical practitioner and when the real physician did take up his abode among them he not uncommonly engaged in some other calling as well and practised his profession as a sideline footnote the first statute providing for the licensing of practitioners in physics and surgery throughout the province was passed in 1795. Up to that time, the quacks had it pretty much their own way. The act was found unworkable and was repealed in 1806. A new and more effective act was passed in 1815. End note. The mother or grandmother, as a rule, was the doctor, nurse, and apothecary for the entire family in the month of september or perhaps october when the phase of the moon was supposed to be favourable for the purpose she organised an expedition to the woods in search of a supply of herbs to replenish her medicine chest in some cases she dug in the ground for roots in others the bark leaves or stems were sought and in others still the fruit or seeds possessed the necessary medicinal properties when she had gathered in her stores, she tied them up in bundles and hung them in the attic, or stowed them away in some convenient nook until required. Her collection contains specifics for nearly every ache and pain. It may be that in those days there was not the mad rush for excitement and wealth, and the average citizen kept better hours, ate more plain and wholesome food, had some respect for the different organs of his body, and did not make such ridiculous demands upon them as are made by some of the high livers of to-day. It may be, too, that mother's simple remedies went a long way to correct the excesses and indulgences of the weak and careless, and to restore the health of the sickly. In any event, the mortality among the pioneers does not appear to have been any greater than it is to-day it may not be out of place to enumerate some of the uses to which some of the common herbs were put as they possess the same if any medicinal properties to-day for coughs and colds a syrup was made from the roots of the spignet another name for spikenard the tuber of the blood-root was dried and then grated into a fine powder 
this was snuffed up the nostrils as a cure for polypus catnip has lost little of its popularity as a medicine for children there are few if any of us who have not protested vehemently against having our mouths pried open to receive a spoonful of tea made from the leaves of this common weed the first symptoms of a stomach ache were sufficient to set the vile decoction brewing and almost any affection of the throat called for a dose of the same liquid the word tansy is derived indirectly from a greek word meaning immortality because the yellow blossoms when dried lose very little of their original shape and colour it is doubtful if the name had anything to do with the prescribing of tansy tea as a tonic it was extensively used for this purpose and i can readily conceive a patient after taking a dose being quite ready to eat the first thing in sight to overcome the disagreeable taste left in his mouth by the medicine hop tea for indigestion and cherry bark tea for regulating the blood were remedies widely known and extensively used reference has already been made to the danger of children falling into the tub of hot water used in scrubbing the unpainted floor this and the open fireplace were sources of great anxiety to the mother of a young family the frequency of severe skulls and burns from these causes created a demand for a soothing and healing salve a favorite prescription was black alder lard rosin and beeswax smartweed steeped in vinegar was applied to bruises and swellings where there was no abrasion it gave instant relief from pain and reduced the swelling for use upon dumb animals particularly the legs of horses wormwood was substituted for smartweed for lame feet and other troubles requiring a soothing poultice the leaves of the plantain were used the stems and ribs were first removed the leaves allowed to wilt and then were crushed by rolling them between the hands a healing anointment for abrasions and open sores was made from the leaves of the ordinary garden bean these were cut up mixed with lard and heated over a slow fire while still hot the liquid lard which had absorbed some of the juice of the leaves was poured off and allowed to cool when it was ready to be applied to the affected part even the roots of the burdock a most persistent and troublesome weed about most country homes were put to an useful purpose these were preserved by being dried and when required were steeped and the tea thus produced was administered as a cure for indigestion and to regulate the blood the mandrake mandragora or may apple has attracted much attention from the days of king solomon to the present day it has figured in literature for many capacities all the way from a death-dealing agent to the main ingredient of a love potion from its roots our forefathers made a tea which they used as a gargle for sore throat the roots of the nerve vine were chewed to quiet the nerves hence the name the roots of elecampany were utilized for man and beast when steeped they produced a soothing and healing lotion for open wounds and made into a syrup were administered to children suffering from whooping cough spearmint tea was given to break up a cold and an infusion of mullein was administered to give relief to the more advanced stages of the same complaint the more bitter the medicine the more frequently was it prescribed thus wormwood tea was regarded as a general tonic to be given in almost all cases where other remedies failed it was not at all uncommon for a plain and simple farmer with no pretension to a knowledge of medicine or surgery to acquire a reputation as a specialist in some particular branch of the profession perhaps in some emergency he would set a broken limb with results so satisfactory that his services would be requisitioned in the next case of a similar character his patients so successfully treated would proclaim his fame abroad and with the little experience thus acquired he would in the eyes of his neighbors become an expert in this operation another may accidentally have had thrust upon him the distinction of being able to reduce a dislocated joint dentists there were none and extraction was the only reliable treatment for troublesome teeth some one in the locality would own one of those instruments of torture a turnkey 
if a molar had been demanding too much attention from its owner and a hot fomentation had failed to overcome the pain the man with the turnkey was paid a visit anaesthetics were unknown and sterilization was not practiced by the unprofessional the victim was seated in a kitchen chair and grasped the rungs on either side the operator loosened the gum from the unruly tooth with the blade of his pocket knife the hook of the turnkey was inserted and with grim determination the two men faced each other the one clung doggedly to the chair the other twisted the key I will draw a curtain over the further details of the operation. Brute strength, in the end, prevailed. Such services were, as a rule, rendered gratuitously, and while we would not care in our day to be at the mercy of such amateur practitioners, yet they were a great benefit to the neighborhood in which they resided, where it was frequently a choice of such aid as they could render, or none at all. Of an entirely different class were the fakirs, who, with little or no knowledge of the diseases they treated and the remedies they prescribed, preyed upon the helplessness of their patients. With such, the two great specifics were opium and mercury. In all cases of doubt, a dose of calomel was administered. Bleeding as a remedial measure was a very common practice, and it was not considered at all extraordinary to relieve a patient of a quart or two of blood at a time the educational qualifications of the quack may be inferred from the following advertisement which was posted up in a public place in eighteen seventeen richmond october seventeen eighteen seventeen advertisement this is to certify that i solomon albert is good to cure any sore in word complaint or any pains rheumatic pains or any complaint whatsoever the subscriber doctors with herbs and roots any person wishing to employ him will find him at dick bell's solomon albert Mr. Albert's parents misjudged the possibilities of their hopeful offspring when they bestowed upon him his Christian name. He must have been quite exhausted after his literary efforts in composing that advertisement. In due season, the need for doctors and medicine was no more, and the grim reaper claimed his harvest. The undertaker had not yet risen to the dignity of a separate calling, and the plumed hearse was unknown simplicity and economy were the main features of the last sad rites the nearest carpenter was furnished with a rough estimate of the proportions of the deceased and with plane and saw he soon shaped a coffin out of basswood boards this was stained on the outside or covered with a cheap cloth and with plain iron handles as its only adornment it was ready for the corpse it was not until well into the nineteenth century that rough outer boxes were brought into general use the funeral service was held at the residence of the deceased after which a silent procession was formed and accompanied the remains to the grave and in the winter season the silence was intensified by removing the bells from the horses and sleighs the general regret over the loss of the deceased was measured by the length of the funeral procession in some neighborhoods there were public graveyards as a rule in the rear of the church but in many instances a plot was selected on the homestead generally a sandy knoll where a grave could be easily dug and there would be little likelihood of a pool of water gathering in the bottom in such a lonely spot were laid the remains of many of our ancestors with a wooden slab at the head of the grave upon this was painted a brief epitaph with a favorite quotation from holy writ in time the lettering yielded to the ravages of the weather the paint was washed away the board rotted and the fence surrounding the reservation if such there was was broken down by the cattle a careless posterity neglected either to remove the remains or to renew the wooden markers by a more enduring monument until sentiment ceased to play its part in the respect for the memory of the dead the farm was sold with no reservation and the plough and harrow soon removed the only visible trace of the last resting-place of those who in their time played important parts in the shaping and destiny of upper canada End of chapter 6 End of Life Among the Loyalists in Upper Canada by W. S. Harrington